Coming to you from the Japanese American National Museum in Little Tokyo, Los Angeles, California. I'm Colin Marshall. This is the Los Angeles Review of Books podcast. For today, I'm speaking with Jay Rubin, scholar and translator of Japanese literature and now a novelist. He is a professor emeritus at Harvard University. He's the author of a book, If You Study Japanese, you might well know, originally called Gone Fishing, but Making Sense of Japanese, and it's sort of better known edition. He's a translator of Well, you'll know the name Haruki Murakami. He's, I would say, the best-known translator of Murakami, who himself is, I would say, one of the most popular novelists in the world, uh, because of a book, not just because, but in, in part because of a book he wrote on Murakami and Murakami's work called Haruki Murakami and the Music of Words. But this is not an interview about Murakami. It's about the new novel Jay Rubin has written. It's called The Sun Gods. It's just out this year, and it's a story told... Between the years, well, between the late 30s and early 1960s, it's a story told during wartime. You know, this this is a quite an important event in the history of Japanese-American relations. But tell me, it's in Seattle for the most part. Most of the story, or a large chunk, is told in Seattle. Why is, or why was Seattle to you a place to tell a story about the love and the hate that that could go on between the Japanese and Americans? Well, living there had a lot to do with it. Sure. <laughs>、uh, I suppose if I had. Taken a job at UCLA rather than the University of Washington, I would have been living it here, and I suspect that I would have still gotten interested in in writing something about about the relocation camps, as they're called. It's a West Coast story, then. It is a, a West Coast story that I first heard about when I was in graduate school in Chicago.、Mm-hmm. I was in my mid twenties, and I was. Shocked and shamed to realize that I didn't know that my own government had locked up close to 120,000 people in concentration camps in our country、um, with no no constitutional or legal basis whatever. But somehow the Supreme Court and the legal establishment managed to twist itself into enough knots to to justify it. It's beautifully. Presented here in the in this、uh, museum of, of the Japanese American National Museum, it really,、uh, this is the first time I've visited this place, and I'm tremendously impressed with、uh, with the way the well the, the the straightforwardness and the honesty with which all of this is is presented. This place is a good example because I was going to say when I was growing up, I grew up actually around Seattle, and now live here in Los Angeles. But the the internment camps got brought up fairly quickly in that era. But the, when you were in grad school, then this was not something very widely discussed that there was this period in American history. No, nobody, nobody knew. It still, you know, I, I, it still amazes me, even these days,、uh, how how little knowledge there is of, of what happened.、Uh, there's a wonderful new book called Infamy by Richard Reeves. That seems to have been written off the walls of this museum. <laughs> It's, it really captures everything, including the redress movement、uh, when our government finally did apologize for what happened, and said straightforwardly that it was all a, a function of race hatred and war hysteria and lack of political will.、Uh, this was part of the official apology to to the Japanese Americans. The impulse to write the Sun Gods then was an impulse to tell the story, to tell, tell a story involving the camps, to tell one story of the camps. Well, I probably should have I should backtrack a little bit and say I, I found out about them when I was in graduate school. That's when I started to read on and off about them. It was still not a really a pressing issue for me, but I I was I was fascinated by it,、uh, kind of kind of uh, uh, offended by it. I should probably say. But I didn't pursue it with all that much energy, and then then I went even further away from the West Coast when I when I started to teach at Harvard in 1970, and stayed there for five years until I moved to Seattle in、uh, 1975 to start teaching at the University of Washington. That's when I started meeting people who had really been locked up. When my my kids grad my kids piano teacher. Turned out to have been in Tule Lake and to have been in Minidoka.、Uh, Shipped out to the middle of America, away from home, not knowing what was going on, really. Absolutely, and it just such a, the, the atmosphere was so utterly different in Seattle, and that was the '70s was the time when the 
the third generation Japanese, the Sansei, were beginning to drag the story of what happened out of their parents. The parents, for the most part, went through it and just shut up. They They'd rather forget. They they tried to forget. They were ashamed of what happened, and uh, it was very hard to get anybody to talk about these things. Mm -hmm. So the seventies was when the story started to come out, and there. I remember shortly after we arrived in. In Seattle, we attended one of the so-called Days of Remembrance, where people got together and talked openly and publicly uh, to each other um, about about the the experience and and what it had meant to them and what, how how much of a blow it had been to their lives. Were there were there particular stories you'd heard from these people that had? made you think you wanted to write about it, or just the general phenomenon made you want to write about it? Or was there some, were there images people had that they could sort of give to you if they, if they could dare to remember them that made you want to put pen to paper yourself about it? I think it's just that, that instead of being words on paper, these were now live human beings who had been through this stuff. And it just simply had been... It became a, a more pressing issue and a more, more kind of uh, emotionally involving thing than it had been when I was seeing it at a distance, reading about it on the East Coast. Um, there were there were books available. I, I do you know Nisei Daughter, the uh, the memoir of a, of a woman who lived in Seattle and was sent to Minidoka. Yeah, wonderful memoir. If you read my book uh, with a fresh memory of Nisei Daughter, you'll find little references to it scattered here and there. Mm -hmm. Say one of my characters lives in the old Carrollton Hotel on the Seattle waterfront. This was the the hotel that was owned by uh, Monica Sone's father, Mr. Itoi. Sone was her her married name. Mm -hmm. And this... she, the uh, the hotel appears briefly. Her sister appears briefly working at the counter uh, because I I knew her her sister's name from uh, from the book. Uh, so I just dropped these little re- reminders. I have one so far. I've had one reader who said I saw all those things. I really know that book so well. Uh, say, they picked each one out one by one. Pretty much. Uh, there's a there's a scene in in the novel where the first. Um, the first Japanese to be shipped out to the so-called uh, not relocation, they're not called relo- what were the uh, assembly center the assembly center was the, usually a a, uh, a fairground or a horse track near, near a major city and the people were shipped out to Puyallup, Washington and were living on a fairground and living in stables well, they were first bust out of the of the city, uh, and this my scene is very much modeled after Monica Sone's description of how her family was shipped out. Mm-hmm. It's all seen from the point of view of of my main character, the, the woman named Mitsuko, who who witnesses this and uh, is justifiably outraged. It can be difficult from the perspective of now to get in the minds of America then, Uh, you know, America in the sense of an America that would lock up Japanese Americans to that great degree. And in part, I I have to almost ascribe to the higher-ups in America back then a sort of sense that almost this this sense that, and and this brings to mind (laughs) something you write actually in Making Sense of Japanese, where you talk about, you know, this, this harmful idea that the Japanese language is mystical, and that only Jap- only real Japanese people can really communicate in it. Because as you as you write in there, it sort of comes out of an Oriental fog. Like there's a sense of you'll never comprehend it uh, among among Westerners learning it. And I feel like Westerners or the Americans at the time, in the aftermath of World War II, they just we we don't know what Japanese people are capable of. They could be psychically communicating. They could be you know I've, you'd hear stories about oh maybe they're signaling planes from fishing boats or what have you, but there's this really, there was a sense that, uh, tell me if this is correct, but in America that the Japanese were so other that they, who knows what they're capable of, we've got to do this. I mean, what was the rationale here? 
Well, in California, especially, one of the main rationales was taking over the land that they had developed over over the decades. The, the first generation Japanese came and did an amazing job of of starting farms, of uh, of actually quite successful, uh, primarily agricultural operations, and their neighbors didn't like this. Their neighbors, their neighbors, and they saw this as a good chance to get hold of some very valuable land and valuable property. So this is the old story of a minority being too successful, too visibly, like, we can't have that. Exactly, mm-hmm. yeah. Another, another theme that's extremely well developed here at the, at the uh, museum. Mm-hmm. It, just, it seems like such a response out of incomprehension. Like, let's just lock up the Japanese people in America and hope that they can't somehow harm us from the inside. I mean, do, do you see what I mean by that? How it seems like, how it seems incomprehension driven? I couldn't resist at one point in the book, um, just, I went on for several pages. Have you read this book, oh, by the way? Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I, li- I like to think I'm talking to somebody who's, who's, uh, who's actually read it, but, uh, let me see. Here, oh, it's at the beginning of chapter 16, mm-hmm. I should have stopped shorter, maybe, but I, here we have like three pages yes, of. Yes, all the quotes. I am for immediate removal of every Japanese on the West Coast to a point deep in the interior. Personally, I hate the Japanese, and that goes for all of them. Let's quit worrying about hurting the enemy's feelings and start doing it. This was the columnist Henry Mclemore. He was one of the more uh, more notorious uh, anti-Japanese uh, agitators. Col- columnist Westbrook, Westbrook Pegler, the Japanese should be under guard to the last man and woman and to hell with habeas corpus. Mm. Every Japanese alien should be removed from this community. I'm also strongly of the conviction that Japanese who are American citizens should be subjected to a more detailed and all-encompassing investigation. This was the San Francisco mayor, Angelo J. Rossi. And they're not mincing words. No, they're not mincing, mincing words. And, and here's one from the, uh, the icon of, of American judicial liberalism, Earl Warren. It seems to me that it is quite significant that in this great state of ours, we have had no fifth column activities and no sabotage reported. That was the history of Pearl Harbor. I think we ought to urge the military command in this area to do the things that are obviously essential to the security of this state. Now, at the time, he was California Attorney General, uh, and he was using, uh, you actually did hear what you think you heard. That is, he was arguing that the fact that there hadn't been any instances of, of sabotage was proof that it was going to happen. Ah, that's, it's hard to get your mind around it now, but. Very hard to get your mind around that. And I, I've heard stories of him being interviewed in his later years. And uh, when asked about this period, he just broke into tears and left the room. Oh, my God. I guess the only response you can have at a certain point, like with that on the record. And it goes on. I've got about three or four pages of that. And they're up here on the wall of the museum, too, these kinds of just absolutely unthinkable things that are just so so hard to get your mind into into where their minds were it's true there there's that and then i also have a hard time i mean it's it's of course vivid in the book but i'm i'm thinking of one of one of the major characters who is a pastor and he he is a reflection in the in a way of this phenomenon he thinks he fears that he he, he marries a japanese woman it's go but he eventually is overcome with fear that he's going to be corrupted from within by her. I mean, it seems like a straight parallel to what was happening in America overall. This guy is just so fearful and so overcome with the sort of guilt and shame, and he, he, he's pinning a lot of things on poor Mitsuko, right? Pinning a lot of psychodrama. Well, thank you for saying that. <laughs> I sometimes wonder if perhaps his sudden change from a, what seems like a, a, an admirable preacher to the to a Japanese uh, congregation to someone who's in the in thrall to all of the racist uh, propaganda that's going on around him is a little too extreme uh, but on the other hand uh, wasn't the whole country kind of a little too extreme in the way it changed there 
there were at the very beginning there were rather heartfelt feelings of of uh, sympathy for the Japanese mm. because they they were being put into such a, a difficult position, but it didn't take long for that to change into an overall racist uh, di- uh, racist out diatribe. But the pastor Thomas Morton, Pearl Harbor seems to be the day, as it was for many. Where he's like, well, now now I'm going to slide toward uh, hatred inexorably. Yes. Well, that clearly had a tremendous impact on everybody at the time. Now tell me, growing up in the aftermath of the Second World War, when what image of Japan did you or could you form, or did you form an image of Japan in, in childhood? Well, John Wayne was my main source of information on oh. the Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> he was fairly unambiguous about the matter, I would imagine. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, they were, I know when I was a kid, the Japs were Japs. Mm-hmm. That was it. And they were somebody that you killed by shooting down their planes or, or whatever you could do to, right. to, to knock out the enemy. That they were the enemy. When you, when you were a kid, that was the image you got of the Japanese, is the enemy. I mean, when did that... When did that fade? Well, I, have, I have no idea, but I know I started getting a little interested in things Japanese in high school when I started reading about Zen. Mm. Definitely Zen doesn't fit with, uh, with, with fighter pilots and, and the kind of people that John Wayne was shooting out of the sky. Did you feel that clash? Was it like, wait, this isn't what I've been learning about the Japanese? Or was it essentially, was the slate still kind of blank because you knew you were watching movies with stock villains that happened to be referred to as Japanese? I do remember noticing that I had been drawn to our two enemies. I I studied German in high school. In fact, I went on to do a little bit of German in, in college. And the next thing I knew, the other language that was attracting my attention was was the other enemy language. So did people ask you about this? You know, what's what's going on with this Axis language? The interest of yours? Uh, I did definitely, even even early on, I definitely had the feeling that it would be a good thing to find out what these human beings were really thinking by learning their language. Uh, unsophisticated as I was, I, I had at least that much awareness that the world could use some some uh, opening up to to these to people who are usually seen as the other and exotic and alien mm. now the sun gods got me thinking of course about this sense of why does a westerner start studying japanese because the son of this pastor thomas morton bill known in early life as as billy morton he has a bit of an awakening where he finds himself driven and thus drives himself to the International District in Seattle to a restaurant, uh, to a Japanese restaurant, where he's just, he feels compelled to go there, and he's he, step by step, one thing leads to another. He feels compelled to learn the language. He starts working there. And his situation is different. He has some memories that, that have gone below the surface of being partially raised or for a while fully raised by this Japanese woman, his, his father's second wife, Mitsuko. But... The, it doesn't sound that different from the stories I hear from a lot of people who uh, start studying Japanese, myself included, Westerners. By people, I mean Western people. Uh, there's always this sense of you tap into something that really draws you in. You can't quite explain it. I mean, did you yourself have trouble explaining why, other than what you just said, learning the lang- wanting to learn the language of the people who were the enemy to understand them better? Was there still some inexplicable bit of it? Well, I, I, I don't claim that, that that thought about learning the enemy's language was, was, a, was a primary motivator. It was something that I kind of noticed somewhere along the way. Hey, look what I've been doing. I've been right. studying German. Now I'm studying Japanese. What the hell is this all about? <laughs> More of that kind of thing. It was retrospect. But my, uh, my initial interest in Japan was almost entirely... Uh, one connected with language and literature. Mm. I, uh, in, uh, toward the end of my second year of college, I had a chance to take some elective course on something that, uh, that didn't fit with my proposed major in philosophy. And I thought, well, not a, not a bad time to do something non-Western. What's, what's available? And I opened up the, the catalog, and there was this course called An Introduction to Japanese Literature. 
Um, and I have generally favorable impressions of things Japanese from my, my little flirtation with Zen in, in high school. I said, well, might as well find out what that's about and spend a quarter and then I'll go on and do, you know, back to my real life and, <laughs> and do, right. do. Put this Japanese behind me for, for good. You know? Right. In, a, in effect, just a, just a little kind of foray into, into something not connected with, with my, uh, with my major. And, uh, I really enjoyed the literature because it was so so poetic, mm-hmm. so beautiful. I thought, and I especially was fascinated by the sense of the language behind what I was reading. Of course, this was a course that was taught for people who knew had no background in in Japanese. It was all the readings were done in English, but the professor. Would bring a would always bring the original book into class. He brought he brought the book that we were reading in English, but he would always bring the original, and he would read us a little from the original and start to explain it in more more uh, literal detail. And invariably, he would reach the conclusion that if you could only read this in the original, you would really. Find out uh, uh, what's going on here. Get it's the real stuff. It's so much better in the original. <laughs> he, and so at a certain point, you're like, well, I guess I. Have to. Yeah, and so and by that point, I had let's see, I had satisfied my foreign language requirement. I had done one year of college German, and I was missing working in a foreign language. Mm-hmm. So this, I think, had something to do with it. I wanted to do some kind of foreign language work, and so that summer. Um, I bought the books that they were using at the University of Chicago for introductory Japanese and started started studying them, uh, studying the, these books as best you can on your own. Um, probably the highlight of that study was while I was working on the ice cream truck that summer and making banana splits. I made the great discovery that the best way to write um, to write Japanese characters with was in ballpoint pen on banana skins. Yeah, you know, I've read you write that, and I, you know, I really, I'd be lying if I said I didn't wonder why how you found that out. So you practiced on the skins from the banana splits. Right. Yeah. Well, I was I had some bananas on the truck, and and I had to, when I took a break, I would pull out my Japanese books and maybe. Right, uh, I, I found that the, the ballpoint pen works so nicely on the banana skins. Anyway, of course, now I, I know. <laughs> yeah, it was just an, an initial taste of the language, and then that fall, I started. I, I got into a course and started studying the language, and got sucked into the swamp of Japanese. <laughs> now, when did you get the sense that? I mean, from what you've written about the Japanese language, it seems like you, it's a priority for you to literally demystify it, to take this sense that it is a mystical, uh, not fully graspable language for the foreigners, to take, to take that away from the process of studying Japanese, which is already hard enough. I mean, when did you get the sense that there might be a little too much mystification around Japanese? When did I get that sense? I suppose it just grew on me from years of teaching. I tended to teach third-year Japanese or or courses of, on modern literature that were for people who had a three or four years background, which, as you probably know, is not enough to really read literature. You can you can kind of decode it and you can you can work your way into it. Uh, that was always my favorite kind of teaching. That is to 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 shepherd people into real literary texts and uh, watch the uh, watch the light in their eyes light up when they suddenly realized what something was about that they had been they had just spent ten hours of homework trying to figure out and it, and it didn't work for them. In the Sun Gods, you have this character, this one. The student in the 50s, inexorably drawn to Japan, mm. uh, Bill Morton, he, he is told by another character, it's one thing to learn the language, but you have to learn the culture as well. There's no just learning a language. Mm. I take it this is a sentiment you share. For sure. Oh, yeah. I mean, there was, I, I studied for four years in Chicago before I ever went to Japan. And... Uh, I, I really, uh, the best I could do when I got to Japan was 
go to a bar and and listen to the woman yammering at me for across the bar and I could all I could say to her was do you know you just used the word wake three times in that sentence every student of japanese is going to be laughing at that now <laughs> but you, you you could you, yeah there's a sense in which you almost have to start over in some respect when you get to the country whose language you're, you've been studying theoretically all those years right right and so then you get immersed in the the, the language and the culture you you, the body language you start learning to bow and right. <laughs> all those things that you where you you're you're absorbing by osmosis rather than mm. memorizing stuff from from uh, textbooks now tell me a little more about the situation of of bill morton in this book in the sun gods because as we say he he goes to japan he he studies japanese before he works in a japanese restaurant he has this interest in japan that he's he's cultivating and he's, he's building but He's in, he's in a distinctive situation. He's not, of course, Japanese American, but he, he almost has that sense of, since he grew up under the guidance of a Japanese woman for a few years, he has within him, he has some, some of Japan kind of embedded within him. How, how do you put it? There are a couple of points in the book where Bill thinks that he'll never find Mitsuko. He's looking for her. And he thinks that his whole point, his whole purpose, of getting into the Japanese language course that he started to take in his senior year, of spending two or three years in graduate school, of traveling to Japan, of studying in, in graduate school in Japan, all of that was pointless because he couldn't find Mitsuko. So that... Right. <laughs> it, it's... Uh, People often lose the initial cause, though, for why they, why they put themselves into a foreign culture. There was, a one, there was one reason, but then that sometimes slips out from under them, and there's mm -hmm. many reasons. Mm -hmm. I, it, it, un, I, I mean, I finally, it is just my sheer fascination with the language, with having my... Uh, ha realizing that my brain has just been doing something that my mother never taught me to do. <laughs> right, it's true. I mean, you've, you've written about this as well, which I find fascinating, that there is, there's such a pleasure in learning another language and reading its literature that you really have to be careful because you could confuse the pleasure of reading in a foreign language with the pleasure of thinking a book's actually any good when it might not be. I mean, tell me a little bit about, about that idea. You know, when, did you, when did you realize that was a danger? Where did I... That, I wrote that, didn't I? You, oh, yes, you wrote it. I think it's in Making Sense of Japanese. Yeah. Uh, I, think, I think I call it linguistic pleasure. Oh, yeah. Sure. Just the sheer joy of making your way through one of these invariably... Ex exotic pages of squiggles <laughs> and realizing that you were able to do it. That uh, I suppose the, the simpler and the more shallow the literature behind it, the, more, the easier it is for you to, to, right. to understand it. So it's a particular danger. This could be just nothing that you're reading. It could be a, some sort of crappy pot boiler, but I got through it. It was great. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's what I mean by linguistic pleasure. Right. How do you guard against that? I mean, at your level, of course, you've been doing it long enough that you, you're, when you're reading a book, you're not <laughs> thrilled that you're reading it. You know you can read Japanese, but for somebody who's just crossing that border, I mean, when you have a character like I feel like Bill in The Sun Gods is experiencing a sense of he's just getting into the culture and things are He's, he's going through quite a struggle himself personally, but he's just entering into Japan. Thing, things are exciting, but he's also, he's also got to figure a lot out at the same time. That's sort of the condition of a first-time translator, right? You know, they're, they're coming to grips, to grips with their own ability at the same time. They've got real work to do. I feel like there's a parallel there. I'm not sure if that's taken it too far. You're talking about the job of finding Mitsuko. Mm -hmm. That's sheer novelistic. Uh, invention. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, in effect, what I'm saying is, I don't have that motivation. I didn't have. I don't have these mysterious memories from mm -hmm. childhood that that lured me into to working on Japanese. Um, there's a kind of uh, kind of grim humor behind this statement that it's not worth doing all these things unless <laughs> unless I find right. unless I find Mitsuko. Well right. obviously he's very motivated. Uh, I I as as the writer of this book I was kind of uh, seduced by the the ease of writing about 
about uh, a first exposure to Japan and Japanese culture. And I had to kind of remind myself, well, that's not what this book is about. You know, this book is about this search for, for a mother that uh, is lurking somewhere in the back of his brain. Mm. You know, it's, it's always fascinating, at least to me, to read about someone's first encounter with Japan if they're a Westerner. But there's also, I guess, cliches to be avoided in that, right? There's, it's a story now often told, but... In the Sun Gods, at least, the, the mission of finding his mother and the, fa- the fact that he considers this Japanese woman his mother, that's something, that's, there's something I've never heard before. I mean, it was, do you have a sense of you didn't want, you wanted to avoid something about the usual West meets East kind of, kind of deal? I think you should be able to tell me better than I can tell you because, I mean, mm-hmm. reading it, did you have a sense that you, you, you were going over ground that had... No, I didn't. That's why I ask. Was it a deliberate avoidance of the usual sort of Westerner goes to Japan type story? I guess, I guess you weren't thinking about that, is what I can draw no, from that. No, I, I was not trying hard to avoid cliches, per se, but right. uh, yeah, I think you would... Uh, thank, you, thank you for letting me know that probably there aren't too many in there. I, I did see one review somewhere... Oh, I remember. It was in the JET program. Do you know, you know the JET program? Which, which sends, well, people sign up to go teach English in Japan, that program. There was a very nice piece in their online newspaper about the book. And it kind of said, oh, well, it's, it has some of this stuff that you would expect of any foreigner who's going to Japan for the first time. But that's not really what's important in the book. <laughs> So he he definitely passed it off as something that was not terribly uh, germane to 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 what's happening in the, in the novel. Do you feel any given how much Japanese literature you've read, how much you've translated? Do you feel in your writing of fiction any influence whatsoever from Japanese literature? Well, did you notice there was a Michiyuki in the book? Yes, you did. <laughs> which, which, where was the Michiyuki? That's what I. All I remember is the actual word. I don't know if I can come up with anything more. Oh, that's true. I did use the word at one point. He was. They were talking about no drama, mm-hmm. and he's saying, "Well, now that he's been utterly crushed in his search for for Mitsuko, what's the point of going back to to class and talking about the Michiyuki in, right. in uh, Kanemori?" Sure. <laughs> I had forgotten about that. No, but there is a passage, the, the passage where Bill is traveling from Tokyo down to Kyushu to pursue, a, to pursue the, the strongest clue he's had so far as to where Mitsuko might be. I pretty consciously wrote it in, in, um, in terms that are similar to uh, the travel travel scenes in Kabuki or in or in No, um, checking in at certain uh, recognizable landmarks and commenting on on them in some in some brief way. Uh, if you've ever read a, a Kabuki play or a, or a No play, or No always has a, has a Michiyuki scene. Mm. Travel is is one of the most indispensable elements in, in the no-drama mm-hmm. because, because people in a no-drama are, are traveling from the everyday world into some kind of transcendent state. So there's always some point at which they, they make this journey. Um, but it's, a, it's in a lot of Japanese uh, drama and literature. And, uh, I, I would think maybe the one that... Uh, the one that's in my book is a little closer to a kabuki kind of uh, 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 michiyuki. It's called michiyuki means just going tra- uh, travel. Say, go. You should explain that, I guess. Sorry. Michi is road, yuki is is going. It's a it's a noun. So it's a road going scene. It's a travel. I'm glad my scene. interpretation of that term was correct. It, 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 the literal interpretation is the correct one. But speaking of landmarks in Japan, now I was talking with somebody who read this novel before I did, and he said, I was asking, should I ask Jay Rubin anything in particular about it? And he says, you know, there's this scene at the Meiji Shrine. You should ask him what happens there. What's going on with the Meiji Shrine? But before I ask you that, uh, for those who don't know, what is the Meiji Shrine? What's the importance of the Meiji Shrine? The Meiji Shrine is a gigantic shrine in the middle of Tokyo that is dedicated to the 
the emperor who ruled the country from 1868 to 1912. When he died, he was given the posthumous name Meiji Tenno. He was not called Meiji Tenno while he was alive, but uh, well, that's what they do with all with all modern emperors. It is a huge place with gigantic Shinto gates, and it's the place that everybody in Tokyo goes on New Year's Day. All 10 million people. I don't know. Obviously, that's 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 not possible. But it feels like it because when you go, Meiji Shrine is such a an important tourist destination. It's always crowded, mm. especially crowded on New Year's Day, where you just get this unbroken flow of humanity. By the time Bill gets to the to the main shrine, he is carrying his friend's little boy on his shoulders because the mother has gotten so tired of carrying him. So he's volunteered. He's put the put the boy on his shoulders, and then uh, he he sees the the way people are are worshiping at the shrine for just a split second they go there they clap their hands together they bow and they go on and he wonders what kind of what kind of uh, reverence is being expressed here mm-hmm. and then the text says it was a moment of reverence to what or for what it didn't seem to matter mm-hmm. with little peter on his shoulders he stepped forward and bowed his head bringing his palms together and closing his eyes mm-hmm. In the few seconds he stood there, the tiny person on his back seemed to grow enormously heavy, as if the power of gravity had suddenly increased, or the boy's flesh had unexpectedly doubled or tripled in density and begun pressing down upon him. He had to plant his feet more firmly upon the earth to support this burden of flesh, and he knew that, if it cost him his life, he must continue to support this infinitely precious burden, this palpably holy child who had been entrusted to him. Then everything was as it had been. Casting one last glance into the empty building, he moved away from the railing to follow David and Martha into the broad stone-paved courtyard where the press of the crowd relented and people were standing in small groups, taking each other's pictures or milling about aimlessly. Down, ordered Peter, who must have spied the other children dashing back and forth among the adults now that they no longer had to fear being crushed to death. Let Daddy take a picture, said David. Peter fidgeted on his shoulders while Bill waited for the click. All right, said David when it was done, and Bill set Peter on the ground. Bill felt a new kind of joy, a euphoria he was aching to share with the Greens, if only he could find the words. Today I learned the meaning of holy infant so tender and mild, he said, smiling broadly. Peter is one of those. Uh, sure, Bill, said David, rubbing his mustache. No, I'm not kidding. It's wonderful. Let me tell you. You should try changing his diaper sometime. You've heard the expression, holy shit, I presume. Martha Martha shrieked and swatted David on the back with her purse. Let's buy some arrows, she said, pointing to a small stand where shrine workers were frantically handing out long white demon-quelling arrows and collecting money from outstretched hands. It goes on like this where Bill is having a terrible time trying to verbalize what this experience has meant to him mm-hmm. and i think it's it's not terribly arcane I, I i i can i can kind of understand why it might not seem like the most straightforward novel uh, the straight, most straightforward scene in a novel that has pretty pretty realistic uh presentation of, of its of its events but uh, I, I like to think it has a lot to do with the title, the mm. sun gods. The sun gods are gods that come into into existence every day and somehow give everyday life, just as it is, without myths, without religion, a sense of being holy, mm. of being divine. And that's what Bill has just sensed in this in this moment at the Meiji Shrine. Not not that the Meiji Emperor was any kind of god but that the people there, the people themselves, were in their ordinary humanness divine. Mm. It's, it's a journey that Bill takes not just into Japan, but it, it's a journey that takes him away to some extent from the sort of stern Christianity of his pastor father. I mean, a lot of the conflict in this book is between seemingly the, the pastor 
uh, Pastor Thomas's version of Christianity and, and the existence of the Japanese people is, is the way he sort of tightly grasps his religion. Uh, it's, it seems to be incompatible with with uh, with Japanese culture or his accepting is his accepting of the sort of the Japanese people around him. Yes. Religion and and reverence in Japan are a little hard to pin down. Uh, I know I was talking to someone the other day and and saying some things that were not too complimentary to Western religion, mm -hmm. Christianity in particular. And I said, "Well, I hope you I hope you're not a I hope you're not a, a believer that would be offended by this. And she said, oh, no, I'm Japanese. Yes. <laughs> as if being... That was ja the contradiction. Yeah. yeah, as if being Japanese was was uh, so obviously a, a divorce from what we think of it in Western terms as, as religiosity. But there are a lot of Japanese Christians, and there are a lot of Japanese who take their Buddhism and other religions seriously. It's uh, again. I, I think most of the people I encounter would 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 understand what she meant. No, no, I'm Japanese, and I, I know there's a, there's a point in my book on Murakami where he's being he's being interviewed uh, about uh, the musician Keith Jarrett, mm -hmm. who who thinks of his music as an expression of his his unity with God. And Murakami is asked what he thinks of that. And Murakami starts out his discussion by saying, well, of course I don't believe in God. Right. As though, the, uh, without any explanation. Yeah, I remember that, of course, very vividly. And that, of course, to me, was terribly important. Mm -hmm. Anybody with half a brain wouldn't, <laughs> be, you know. It, it really does seem to be the implication right, there. Right. Would you say that Bill has lost his religion by the end of this book? Oh yeah, in terms of any kind of organized religion, certainly, not, certainly the the rather stern Christianity that he's grown up with, he's yeah, he's come to what he feels is a realization that it's a lot of impressive sounding verbiage that if you if you examine it doesn't mean a whole lot. Did, did Japan teach him that? I think his uh, his disillusionment with his father was the main thing that taught him that. You know, his father comes across as someone who's a, a very eloquent speaker, someone who can who can drop a, a Christian cliche at the uh, it, with, uh, without the slightest hesitation. And it's fine. It's in his senior year in college that he begins to realize how much of his religion is words just words and that if you go beyond resonant uh, phrases like the blood of the lamb or, or or whatever what is that finally and uh, he, he certainly begun to have deep doubts by the by the by the uh, end of his senior year while where he, he, by the way, he's studying at a, a small Christian college in, in Seattle. Um, just the further, the further work on Japan and Japanese uh, continues that, that, that disillusionment, that sense that there really isn't any need to, to supply fairy tales to the explanation of what makes what makes life uh, innately holy? I suppose it is to some extent talked about as a stereotype of Japanese culture that they value words less and actions more. There, do you think there's any grain of truth to it? I would hesitate to say yes in this case because uh, there's been so much resonant nonsense about <laughs> silence in resonant Japan. Nonsense. Was <laughs> then inspired resonant nonsense about uh, about the, the 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 deep silences in in Japan and in the Japanese uh, cultural milieu. Uh, I don't know anybody who likes kaisetsu more than the Japanese explanations. Every book, you, it's hard to find a book in Japan that doesn't have 
a post a post word, an afterword, or, or an introduction, or something that's that tries to tell the reader how they're supposed to read it. It's um, the Japanese are very verbal, very fond of uh, of guidance, of verbal guidance in the meaning of uh, in the meaning of experience and culture. So I really I really tend to shy away from from this this uh, cliche about the Japanese being non-verbal and more action-oriented. It's, it's, it's true, you can get the sense it's a culture that also has its fair share of explanation, as you say, but I, let, me, let me go back to the writing of this book a little bit. When, when did you begin writing this book? This is, not, this is not a book written entirely recently. Yes, it's been a longer-term project. <laughs> not entirely recently, no. Mm started in 1985 that's that's kind of a long time ago maybe before you were born no I was born in 1984 okay. close right around there yeah. uh, we had been living in Seattle for 10 years by then so really had been absorbing that Seattle atmosphere for a good long time before deciding to to try to write a book that not not only conveyed the facts of the of the relocation camps, but the the the, the gut feeling of it. Mm. And a piece of fiction is what you're going to resort to if you're trying not simply to relate facts, but uh, but emotion. I don't know if you've seen. Have you seen the new book Infamy by Richard Reeves, or did I mention that earlier? In I mentioned this? it, but I haven't read it yet. No. Yeah, I, I highly recommend it. Even even this, which is primarily, uh, which is a, a uh, an objective, highly researched book of history, um, does such a good job of putting that history together that I, I think the no no writer no reader is going to come away from it and and not be moved by by the the infamy in the title the infamy of the United States government's mistreatment of, of its Japanese citizens. But finally, it is a book of history, and it's not trying to get you all worked up. I'm trying to get my reader all worked up. <laughs> right. Yes, yes, that's the, that's the difference. Yeah. I mean, did you did you write it entirely in the 1980s and come back to it more recently, or how did that work? We wrote it over. Well, my wife certainly was a major part of of this proje project because we would discuss where every scene. We would discuss where the book should go, what the character should do, and. Uh, I'm, I was the one who did all the writing. Once we would have an idea of where the book was going, I, I'm the one who sat down at the computer and put the words down. But um, it was very much a joint project. It took about two years to to get a, a book that could be shown to agents, except that no agents wanted to see it. Mm. And uh, we tried a couple of publishers, didn't get any interest Partly, I think, because the mm, American society wasn't quite ready for this. I think. Am I patting myself on the back if I say that we were ahead of? Hard to say, but <laughs> we were ahead of our time. We, we, <laughs> but now <laughs> the time has come. Then, in some sense, culturally, you think? Absolutely. You know, kids learn about this stuff in high school now. They never did before. Right. Like what? Maybe ten years ago at the most that. It became part of mainstream American history, where people would learn these things. How old is this in this museum? About ten years old, I think. Maybe a, maybe a little more. I'm not sure, but it's been it's been a more re, it's been a recent ish development. And as I say, it's something I remember learning about to some extent in school as well. So you're not introducing. You needed to not be introducing the idea of the camps to people essentially in your novel. Like they needed to, they the cultural awareness needed to be there. I think so, and and I, and which is why it was such a. After having found no interest, having to, to, to have it snapped up so so quickly by Chin Music Press was such a shock, a pleasurable shock. You know, to, they 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 loved the book right away and said, "Oh, we would be we would love to publish it." And uh, it was it was a great turning point for for us. But that was also when. Well, I, I, we were determined to publish it this year, no matter what, and we were assuming that it was going to be self-publishing through Amazon. You know, what is it? Create Space, and uh, 
instead of just leaving the, the story to rot in on my five inch discs, we we decided <laughs> to the old ones, huh? Yeah, oh. it really I had to resurrect it from those old discs. Um, this was going to be the year, the 70th anniversary of the end of the war. We were, we were going to bring it out no matter what. So I tried one last time. I talked to uh, I talked to a couple of people who advised me what kind of publisher I could go to, and we ended up going to Chin Music Press in Seattle, a small but very fine press. They very suitably located. <laughs> perfectly located. Yes. That's true. And, and I, you know. Uh, Considering that we were just going to self-publish and probably get 12 readers, or maybe may, maybe 20, you know, 24 at most, the possibility that it might only be a Seattle book that appears appeals only to Seattle people that would be fine with us. Preferably, it should go beyond that. Preferably, more people should read it. And uh, but you know, anything beyond self-publishing was was a great plus. So we're we're thrilled that it that they took it on, but doubly thrilled that they assigned Todd Shimoda, the, the novelist, to to work with me on it and go over it and tell me where I had suddenly lapsed from writing like a novelist to writing like a professor. Ah, oh, I see. Too <laughs> much was, histo- history. Too well, it wasn't the amount, it was the it was the voice. Oh. It was the consistency of voice that he was very good at uh, sensing when I had suddenly started lecturing my reader rather than rather than having my characters uh, perceive things. That was probably the best thing that, that Todd did for the book, and that is to, to make the voice far more consistent. He helped me think about the um, the flow of events, the the the, the uh, there are a couple of points in the book where where I've changed the order of the, of the chapters. I think anybody who read it 30 years ago and then saw the new form would would certainly say it's the same book. So it's it's definitely the, the same book, but I think it's a lot better. I think the the characters are sharper, the 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 voice is more consistent, the uh, the the uh, chronology certainly is tighter. So it's it's vastly improved, but yeah, in effect, it's that thirty-year-old book. <laughs> so, the I wanted to come back to finally this issue of you know you live in Seattle, so much of the book is set in Seattle. Chin Music Press is in Seattle. As I say, I grew up around there a, a bit myself, and the International District, the the Japan Town, the equivalent of Little Tokyo in Los Angeles, where we sit now. That's a place where in the 1950s, this character Bill Morton taps back into his interest in Japan. And that same neighborhood was where I, myself, to a large extent, got interested in Japan. But even apart from that neighborhood, I mean, is Seattle still to you a, a place with a close connection to Japan? Or what kind of a connection does Seattle have to Japan, to your mind, these days? Well, I mean, there's the very practical question of trade and of being on the other side of the Pacific Ocean. So you really do have a strong sense that Japan is over there, and all you have to do is get on a boat and you can get there. Um, yeah, Japan looms larger, certainly, there than it does on the East Coast. So certainly, uh, that's true of, of Los Angeles, too. Did you Spending- sense that when you would, when you lived on the East Coast and when you... Were in Seattle the, the difference, the difference in Japan consciousness? Absolutely, yeah. It was a very strong sense of part part of why we like living in Seattle. Um, it was a little hard to tear myself away from that to to go to live on the East Coast for 13 years. In fact, we never really did tear ourselves away. We kept our house in uh-huh. suburban <laughs> Seattle. A foot here, a foot there. But uh, you know, on the East Coast, you were living sort of near Haruki Murakami, yes? So that was, uh, there was an advantage to that. Yeah, well, he was he was only there for a couple of years, and we fortunately lived down the street from him for a couple of years and That's had a wonderful... Speaking of convenient yeah, uh, positioning, yeah, no, with you, the translator true. of this, this writer. So... Uh, my time in Harvard was terrific. I'm not. I, I, I miss. I miss Cambridge a lot. But uh, 
the the nearness of Japan is is very is, is something you feel you know, when you're in Seattle and certainly here. I'm going around Little Tokyo today. I'm sh- shocked to see how much how stronger how much stronger it is even here than it is in Seattle. Oh really? It's, oh it's yeah. Even more? Oh yeah. And this yeah. isn't our only Japan town. There's one over west too, Sautel. So next time you're in Los Angeles, there's a whole other Japan town to explore. Oh, terrific! <laughs> I'll check it out. <laughs> something to know for your trip. But I'm glad you've made this trip so we could talk about the sun gods, which listeners is a book you can read to hear more about Japan, America, the love and hate between them, Seattle, uh, wartime, the camps, plenty of history in it, none of it in the form of lectures, all of it in the form of a novel by Jay Rubin, my guest today, who is also a translator and scholar of Japanese literature. You may know him as a translator for Haruki Murakami, as the author of uh, Haruki Murakami and the Music of Words, as the author of Gone Fishing or Making Sense of Japanese, and I do hope more books in the future. Thanks so much. Thanks an awful lot. I enjoyed this. This has been the Los Angeles Review of Books podcast. I've been Colin Marshall. You can keep up with me at colinmarshall.org or with the LARB at lareviewofbooks.org. Thanks.